If your deranged coworker forced you to join him on his rampage through the community, what would you do? It looks like old Benson's finally had enough, and apparently he's decided to make that other people's problem. However, this guy's not content with simply blowing away folks that make his life miserable on a daily basis. He has an entire day full of fun activities all planned out, and unfortunately for our protagonist, he doesn't intend to knock them out alone. I'm going to break down the mistakes made what you should do and how to beat crushing indecisiveness in The Passenger. Bradley is just along for the ride. Dude all but outright refuses to stand up for himself in pretty much any situation. Literally to the point all his co-workers call him by the wrong name because he's too much of a doormat to bother correcting them. Knowing this, it should come as no surprise that when the workplace bully, Chris, forces him to eat a day-old nasty burger, Bradley starts chowing down without the slightest bit of resistance. I mean, just look at him. Poor Sap doesn't even hesitate when told to take a second bite. Now, you're probably thinking, this guy's working his way up to a certified quiet kid moment, but you'd be wrong. Instead, that role goes to fellow burger jockey, Benson. And as we're about to find out, he was already there when he clocked in this morning. Of course, regardless of whether or not he was still on the fence about executing Order 66, receiving an insult-infused threat from Chris after trying to intervene certainly didn't help to restore his faith in humanity. Humanity. No problem turning your peaceful redneck existence into a living hell. We understand each other? Looks like Chris here is attempting to f around. All right, hear me out. I'm not trying to make excuses for what Benson's about to do, but as a general survival rule, it's best to avoid needlessly harassing or threatening people, especially people you aren't all that familiar with. After all, you never know what someone's going through. And virtually all humans, young and old, are capable of extreme violence, given the proper combination of rage and motivation. Sure, most people won't do anything about it, and the few that will probably won't take things to the extreme. But if there were even a 1 in 300 chance that the person you were about to antagonize at no benefit to yourself might go back to his car, pull out a side-by-side -side shotgun, and blow your rotten guts out, would you still do it? Shut the f*** and now he found out. Messed up as it was, had Benton stopped there, I might have been able to sympathize with him to a degree. But after watching him smoke Chris's girlfriend and their overbearing manager in cold blood, it's pretty clear he's just a sick piece of sh in that case, I gotta wonder why Bradley would stand around sucking wind like the world's dumbest fish instead of rushing in for the disarm when Benson was focused on the back room. At that distance, it'd be fairly difficult for an unsuspecting shooter to react, turn, and reacquire before we'd be right on top of him. And with the shotgun's long barrels, there'd be plenty of real estate to hold on to during a struggle. Alternatively, we could have used the opportunity to bolt out the front door and leave the others to their respective fate. Even if Benson were able to turn back in time, hitting a person moving laterally at a dead sprint is no easy task. Oh, but nerd you say, he's got a shotgun. And as video games have taught me, shotguns spread the width of a grand piano at a distance of two and a half feet. Yeah, not so much. In reality, the spread with buckshot at 10 yards could be anywhere from two to 10 inches, depending on a variety of factors. And while that still doesn't sound too comforting, Benson won't have to rely on any amount of shot dispersion to blow our friggin' heads off while we're standing perfectly still. Seriously though, you just watch this guy turn his gun on someone who had absolutely nothing to do with the situation. I'd say there's a better than average chance he'll be coming back for you at some point, unless you do something right now. However, in what might be the strangest way imaginable, it turns out today is our guy's lucky day. Instead of wasting him on the spot like the others, he orders Bradley to help him haul the bodies into the freezer and mop up the blood before the next shift arrives. Makes sense to me. Only question I have during this time is what happened to the shotgun? Benson is no bodybuilder. That's for damn. 
sure. And while he'd probably have an edge on Bradley in terms of aggression, his ability to control the situation leans heavily on his possession of a firearm. And yet, we can clearly see at least three cases where he walks away from it, all of which would have been a prime opportunity for us to scoop in and score. The first is when he sets it down on a nearby table to drag Chris away. Bradley is helping pull one of the legs, but with both of Benson's hands occupied, it wouldn't be difficult for someone with actual survival instincts to pop him in the jaw and make a grab for the break action. We see a similar situation to this when Bradley's in the back doing nothing while Benson Firearm carries Jess's body in by himself. Seems like a total waste of a hostage situation if you ask me. At any rate, dude walks completely inside the freezer and then takes the time to carefully lower the dead person down instead of simply tossing her in like a sack of flour. Honestly, forget the shotgun right now. Kick him in the while he's bent over and slammed the freezer door behind him. There doesn't appear to be an emergency release on that dead trap, so he'd be pretty much hosed until the cops showed up. Finally, and perhaps the most egregious missed opportunity on Bradley's part is when they're both cleaning up all the blood. We can clearly see the shotgun sitting on a table off to the left while Benson's mopping up the floor. Meanwhile, he's got his back turned to Bradley, who could easily throw him in a rear naked choke before he even had a chance to react. Don't like touching people? Fine. Splash some of that cleaning fluid in his eyes and go for the boomstick while he's busy clawing his eyes out. As we've mentioned before on this channel, blind people are way easier to shoot. You know, except for that one chicken. See for me. Of course, because Bradley can't be bothered to risk his own life to save his own life, he winds up getting walked out to Benson's wage cage for an impromptu road trip. And yeah, screw that. Bradley, I could have killed you a hundred times by now. Will you get in the Car. Oh, well, when you put it like that, get the out of here, dude. No way I'm going to a second location with this nut job. As I've relentlessly harped on in previous videos, you are statistically more likely to survive being shot than getting in a car with the person holding you at gunpoint. Although, your mileage may vary. After all, most shootings involve handguns, since they're the most common. And in this case, Benson's got a 12 gauge with buckshot, which is a little like shooting someone with a handgun nine times at once. It's still not enough to make me hop in with him. Dude's probably planning to unalive us somewhere and make it look like Bradley was behind the Burger Joint Massacre. Kind of like how What's-His-Name got away with it in Rampage. Now is when we put everything we've got into launching a last-ditch counter ambush. Ideally, while Benson stupidly drops his piece in the trunk to take off his shirt. If we're quick, we might be able to slam the hatch shut before he can retrieve it. At which point, it all comes down to what the boss taught us about CQC. Running into those nearby woods might also be an option at that point, as long as we knew for certain we could outrun him. Ultimately, Bradley falls back on his tried and true strategy of doing nothing and obeys his captor's command like a nervous dog, only to then be handed yet another prime opportunity to escape, which he will undoubtedly do nothing with. I mean, how pathetic do you have to seem for your kidnapper to lay the barrel of his shotgun across your lap and assume you won't immediately make a grab for it the second he gets on the road. As long as the car was in motion, he'd have to choose between steering and keeping both hands on the weapon. So it'd be best to wait until he's turning to make our play, especially if it's a left turn at an intersection. Best case scenario, he'll panic and run the car off the road, but most likely he'll just slam on the brakes and fight us as hard as he can. Either way, it's going to attract attention from passing motorists, and if we're lucky, the police. So far, by my count, Bradley's passed up on six solid opportunities to act, but none of these blunders even remotely compare to what happens next. Benson straight up leaves the shotgun in the backseat of the car while the two of them sit down for some homicide hash browns at the local diner. And once again, our hero doesn't even lift a finger. Like, I can understand how the presence of a firearm might leave some people too terrified to act in these circumstances, but when it's currently sitting useless in a 
locked vehicle 20 yards away, that excuse pretty much goes out the window. You are 20 years old, and you are already more pathetic than every person in this godforsaken town. On this, we can agree. For Christ's sake, man, if you're not gonna try to run away or stab him with a fork or whatever, at least try calling out for help on the off chance one of these old timers brought his 1911 along for some two world wars action. And before you even bring up the possibility that Benson has another gun on him, if that were true, why would he have done that stupid sh with a shotgun the whole way here. Based on their conversation during the ride over, Benson's primary concern is getting as much as he possibly can out of the estimated seven hours he has before the second shift discovers the bodies. Which means if we make a scene in here, he might try and drive away before the cops show up. Either way, it's still a better option than cruising around with a murderer all day, waiting for him to plow us into a tree at 100 miles an hour. Unfortunately, it seems Benson's found himself a side quest. Turns out, he too would like to know how Bradley became so worthless, and he's willing to spend a significant chunk of his extremely limited time sorting this out. Don't get it twisted though. Benson makes it clear he'll still waste Bradley and or others if he steps out of line. Apparently, he just really wants to get to the bottom of this before going out in a blaze of glory. And so, after swinging by his house for a change of clothes and a weapon swap, the two men set out on a mission to get Bradley Bradley's mojo back, assuming he ever had any to begin with. Of course, I could probably talk about how we have had yet another perfect opportunity to escape while we were left alone in Benson's living room. But at this point, I feel like Bradley's also a little curious as to whether his condition is terminal. Whatever the case, Benson decides the best place to start is by dropping in on Bradley's ex-girlfriend, Lisa, to ask her about the real reason she broke up with him a while back. Her cat died. You're saying she said I can't date you because my cat died? Well, he didn't say how it died. Maybe Bradley's more of a dog person. You know what I mean. Jokes aside, that's a pretty lame excuse to dump someone, but I'm sure there's plenty worse out there. Bad breakup or not, it probably wasn't a good idea for Bradley to tell his new best friend that Lisa works at the mall. He's already made it clear he intends to meddle into his personal life, so it stands to reason we'd end up paying her a visit and potentially putting your life at risk. Besides, they've stopped dating like two years ago. How hard would it have been to simply say she moved away or something? Thing. However, before the two men can pay tribute to the rotting corpse of a small town mall, Benson pulls over to get some gas, giving Bradley yet another opportunity to make his escape, or so it seems. Sure, we could definitely hightail and put ourselves outside the practical range of that snub nose the second he looks away. Problem is, we aren't the only ones out here, and our captor lets us know he won't hesitate to trade the clerk's life for ours if we get any ideas. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Benson seemingly plans to stay on the run for as long as possible, and a dead gas station attendant is bound to be discovered long before the bodies in the walk-in. Does that mean he won't pull the trigger here? Absolutely not. Dude has clearly gone off the deep end, so we shouldn't assume his decision making will at all remain rational or consistent. He could suddenly change his mind about this whole extreme makeover wuss edition he's got going on and blow her head off at the drop of a hat. And for that reason, I'm booking it. Yeah, yeah, call me a psychopath all you want. Fact is, if Scumbag shoots him, he might die. But if we get back in the car, we'll almost certainly die. He has to get lucky once. We have to get lucky over and over again the rest of the day, and maybe even longer. I mean, come on, do you really think Benson's just gonna let us walk away at the end of this to narc on him, I doubt it. Ultimately, Bradley maintains his commitment to perpetual inaction and stays put like the good little dog he is. Although, I will say, this particular situation wasn't nearly as cut and dry as the ones we've looked at previously. And credit where it's due, he did at least consider running away for a second, so I'd definitely call that an improvement. Maybe Benson's right about him being fixable after all. With that out of the way, the boys finally arrive at the mall and head to the legally distinct version of Build-A-Bear workshop housed within. Unfortunately, not only is Lisa working today, she's also the only one working today, meaning there's no one around to run interference on her potential stalker and his fuzzy friend while she slips out the back. That said, she can still tell him to off, which she eventually does, albeit in a much nicer terminology. You want to decorate stuffed animals? Yeah, 
you talk to me while I do it. <laughs> Too bad Bradley has an ace up his sleeve. Yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, right to refuse service. Of course, some of you might be thinking Bradley should take this opportunity to drop some kind of subtle hint or clue that he's under duress. Maybe something like mouthing help me with his back turned to Benson. And while this might be a good idea where he's speaking with a police officer or armed security guard or someone trained to identify dangerous situations, springing this on an unsuspecting ex would likely cause her to react in such a way that gives away this betrayal, thereby putting both of their lives in immediate jeopardy. You can tell Benson is expecting this as well, as he positions himself in such a way that allows him to watch Bradley's every move during their discussion. Honestly, this is where our guy's preference for passivity comes in handy. Now, don't get me wrong, he's not, not doing anything on purpose. It's simply his nature. But a more aggressive person might have tried spelling out 911 one in sequence or something that Benson would have spotted when he came over to check on them. As for why Lisa broke up with Bradley, who actually cares? What's important is that her explanation leaves Benson satisfied on the matter and gets them out the door before something horrible could happen. And that's not all it does. Evidently, something about the experience inspires Bradley to finally come clean about the childhood trauma that made him the man he is today. Yeah, brace yourself for this one. So, when he was seven years old, his second grade teacher singled him out on something everyone was doing, and in response, he flicked an eraser at her. Only, this was no ordinary eraser. It had a tiny piece of pencil lead stuck in it, and wouldn't you know it, the thing found its way directly into her eyeball, leaving her permanently blind on that side as a result. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. The ridicule this poor woman received from both her students and fellow teachers after coming back to school with an eye patch caused her to suffer a full-blown nervous breakdown and generally ruined her entire life. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is all very funny, but what does it have to do with Bradley acting like a straight-up sea sponge for the rest of his life? Well, follow Following the incident, he decided that actually doing the things he wants to do might get other people hurt, and he's let the whole world walk all over him ever since. As for the unfortunate Miss Beard, what's she do now? She's back to teaching. Bro. Why would you tell him that? Do just force you to have it out with some girl you haven't seen in years. Obviously, he's going to want to track her down for another struggle session. The good news is that today is Saturday, so there's no risk of Benson squeezing Trig on a one-eyed school teacher in front of her entire class. The bad news is that we're in a small town, and as anyone who's grown up in rural America can tell you, confidentiality and privacy just aren't a thing out here. All the dynamic duo has to do to get Get her home address is tell the secretary that young Lee Harvey over here wants to finish the job. I mean, apologize. However, just when it looks like they're about to leave without incident, Benson recognizes the elderly vice principal from his time in the third grade, and it seems our hero isn't the only one harboring unresolved issues with the former teacher. Hey, Shepard. <laughs> Hey, uh, Bradley, still think not doing anything keeps people safe? Apparently not, as he finally musters the nerve to get off his ass before Benson can put one through the old man's teeth. Doesn't stop him from catching a pistol whip, though. Well, I guess that about does it for Benson's time on the run, right? After all, Mr. Shepard will almost certainly provide a description of the attacker and his vehicle to the police once help arrives, at which point it'll only be a matter of time before they're spotted and taken into custody. Yeah. Yeah, here's the thing. Turns out, Bradley's character development came in a little too little too late, as the man wound up succumbing to his injuries before he could explain what happened. Not saying it's entirely his fault, but given the victim's age and physical condition, he probably should have realized the beating alone might be enough to kill him. As for why no one at the school immediately connects the assault with the two men who literally followed him into the parking lot, I can't say for certain, but this blunder allows them to reach the Blackbeard's front door without any issue. Lee, is that you? Yeah, hi. 
Good to see the one eye still works fine. It also looks like she's not quite as broken up about the incident as Bradley might have thought. Regardless, he's still having a hell of a time saying what he needs to say, prompting Miss Beard to kindly invite them in for tea. Naturally, the correct response to this invitation goes something like, no thank you. There's a dangerous psychopath breathing down my neck who may very well snap and blow your head off at the drop of a hat. But without thinking about the possible consequences of dragging this encounter out longer than it needs to be, Bradley accepts and unwittingly signs her up for the worst day of her life in 14 years. Seriously, dude, all you had to do was tell her you didn't have time and that you just came by to apologize for what you did when you were seven. The only upside to this mistake is that it gives them time to speak alone while Benson leaves to use the bathroom. But does Bradley take advantage of this opportunity to quietly warn Miss Beard about the violent lunatic she just welcomed into her home? What do you think? Yeah. Yes, it's safe to assume Benson might be listening for anything unusual from inside the bathroom, but we could still get the point across by motioning in his direction and making a gun symbol with our hand. As long as that eraser didn't lodge itself in our brain, this should be enough for her to realize what's going on. And then we can either run like hell out the front door, break line of sight with the house, or try to get help on the way. In the case of the latter, we're in luck, as Miss Beard has a landline. So all she'd have to do is dial 911 and they should be able to pinpoint her location without her saying a word. Alternatively, we could call and hang up and wait for them to call back as is standard procedure. At which time, we could act like we're taking a totally unrelated call. I'm sure by now we've all heard about the case of the domestic violence victim who successfully called the police by pretending to order a pizza. If nothing else, a little heads up might have at least kept her from reacting visibly to the sight of Benson's jacked up hands after hearing about Mr. Shepard. Of course, it would have also been nice if whoever called from the school mentioned the part about how they gave out her address right before that happened. In any case, now Benson wants to bring her along on this pointless journey, lest she call the whole thing in. And you know what that means. Time to fight like to keep from throwing ourselves at the mercy of a known murderer. Besides, now we have the benefit of taking him two on one, and Benson even brings his gun hand recklessly close to Bradley while walking the latest hostage out the door. I'm only joking, of course. Look at who we're talking about here. Benson would have beaten Miss Beard half to death before Bradley even opened his mouth. Although, that's still no reason for her not to at least try to fend him off. However, unbeknownst to everyone else, Bradley did make at least one good decision during this episode when he secretly stole the teacher's cell phone. And upon returning to the same diner from earlier, he manages to finagle himself a chance to use it by asking for a bathroom break. Oh, there's, there's a situation at the Cutsburg Diner. He's a, a man with a gun. No, he, he's not necessarily gonna hurt anyone. So Holy f Dude, spit it out. There's a man with a gun at the Cutsburg Diner. He's killed four people. He's white, average height, brown hair, and he's wearing the Grinch who stole Christmas. Blitz the house. That's all you have to say. I mean, for Christ's sake, you're making it sound like you saw a concealed carrier's jacket ride up or something. <sighs> well, whatever. At least Bradley can say he finally did something for once. And of course, now that he has, he thinks he's grown up enough to tell Benson what a colossal waste of time this all was. Dude clearly never had a plan from the very beginning, which is why he latched on to the BS cause of fixing Bradley the way that he did. Of course, hearing all this makes Benson flip the out. Because what else was it going to do? We should have been doing everything we possibly could to keep him calm right now, not aggravate him to the point he's ready to gun down everyone in the restaurant. Besides, it's only going to get worse when he hears the sound of sirens approaching. It was you, wasn't it, you fucking and to think, if he'd done that this morning, he could have been in another state by now. That said, it seems Benson really does care for his pathetic co-worker. So much so, that when Bradley admits it was, in fact, he who called the cops, the sting of betrayal makes him realize what an absolute he's been today. And so, instead of putting the gun down and facing the consequences of his actions before a judge like a man, he decides to take the easy way out and force his own demise by permanently traumatizing a pair of small town police officers. No! Go, go! Go, go! 
Look on the bright side. At least he saved the taxpayers money. And with that, Benson's reign of terror has finally come to an end. And Bradley is finally free to go on living his life like a human mouse. Nah, he actually grows a pair after this and starts wearing a polo shirt. In the end, Bradley made it out alive. However, had he taken advantage of the many, many, many opportunities he had to get away early on, he could have avoided this entire situation and perhaps even stopped Benson from hurting anyone else. For that reason, I think the passenger was beat. Moral of the story, getting kidnapped is cheaper than going to therapy. But yeah, you should probably just go to therapy if you can.